All right. As I stated, I have special guest Michael Stone on the show today. Michael, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I've got a, uh, you've got quite a resume here. Michael's been in the construction space for a long time. Uh, he's the owner of Markup and Profit. You can find him at markupandprofit.com. He's got programs. He's got coaching. He's got books. He's got live events. He's got, uh, you can book him for um, uh, business strategy. He's got books. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of great stuff. I, I really spent a lot of time on your website. So really mm -hmm. looking forward to, to getting into it today. Mm -hmm. So just to start off, uh, for those of you that, for those of our listeners and watchers that don't know you, kind of give a little bit of background about how long you've been in the industry and how you got, how you launched Markup and Profit. Okay. Well, my dad owned a, uh, probably one of the largest electrical and HVAC contracting businesses in the Midwest for many years. And of course, when I got old enough to push a broom, I was always busy cleaning and, and whatever. Um, I started estimating projects with him back in 1954, and that was electrical, uh, HVAC, um, power and telephone lines, that kind of stuff. And during the years, I worked in a variety of trades, uh, did a short, uh, did uh, three years in the Army, in which I was involved in construction there as well. And I've worked in a variety of trades after that. Uh, you name it, I've worked at it. And even when I was working uh, full-time as a plumber, I would volunteer other to other trades like tile setters or floor covering or painters. I'd go work with them nights and weekends for free as long as they gave me as much information, answer all my questions. I was trying to learn about these other trades because I wanted to all, go all around a background, which I got. Anyway, I worked at that and... Uh, eventually, I worked my way to the point where I liked estimating. I was good with numbers, and I worked my way into a full-time estimating position in 1969. Um, I worked for four or five companies or since then, uh, two that I've owned myself, and then I worked for two of the largest remodeling contractors in the nation. Um, I wrote the Markup and Profit book, uh, started it in 95, finished it in 90 early 98 and it came out in January of 99. Uh, instantly we had, you know, just a swarm of, of people asking me to do talks and classes and seminars and you name it. And so we kind of, we kind of drifted out of our construction business and into full-time uh, coaching. Uh, uh, also I got certified for arbitrations in 1997. So I've done a lot of arbitrations all over the western half of the United States. Um, I also wrote a book on, uh, I knew a lot of contractors had trouble with sales, and so I wrote a book on, on it called Profitable Sales, a Contractor's Guide, and that came out in 2007. Um, we've been very fortunate. Our, our book is, our markup and profit book is approaching 100,000 books sold over the years. Wow. Uh, we've had, um, we've got clients in 42 countries around the world. Um, and I guess if to sum everything up, what do we do best or what do we try to do best? And that is we try to help contractors take care of their families. Now, if you have to, you have to work that backwards, but that's essentially, that's where we started our business. We run our business, our coaching clients. I just tell them, you know, my job is to help you take care of your family. And we're going to do that by making you the best businessman you can be. And here's how we're going to do that. So I just work it backwards, but essentially it's, it's about helping people take care of their families, which um, a lot of them forget that, you know, as their primary objective, they forget that as they get into business and they start getting pulled this way and that way and whatever, and, you know, uh, it's real easy to get distracted as you well know. So anyway, that's basically what we do. Okay. Well, that's great. And, and just for those of you listening or watching and definitely check out the website because it's a wealth of information. And, and you, the reason I was excited to have you on the show is because you are an expert. I mean, there's, there's, I think there's a thing, a deal out there that says to achieve expertise, you need to 10,000 hours in a certain field or whatever. Well, you've had, that takes about five years working full time. So you've had decades of experience <laughs> And, yeah. <laughs> and many different fields of uh, construction and contracting. And then you decided to educate and equip people. I mean, you're clearly an expert. And so I, I want to kind of go broad in this podcast, but then I'd like to have you back on 
maybe once a year or once every six or eight months to go really deep on some of these things we're going to talk about today. But sure. ha having said that, I mean, you've looked in at hundreds of companies, you've coached a lot of business owners, you've worked with a lot of roofing contractors, different contractors. What's one of the biggest pitfalls you see with contractors today that you just see over and over and over again? Okay, this, this, this recent pandemic has really brought out the biggest problem I see with most contractors. They don't have what I call an operating capital reserve account, a forced savings account that they can fall back on in case of any kind of an emergency, the money's there, they can reach into it, pull it out, pay their bill, make an investment, do whatever they want to do. Most contractors don't have it. That's why that, you know, there are several uh, people put up, they have websites and they said, well, this is how you apply, you apply for these government grants, these government loans, all this free money and all these contractors jumped into the middle is, hey gang, I'll tell you something, there ain't no free money. There's no free lunch. And the sooner people wake up to that, the better. If, if it's, the, Zig Ziglar used to have a saying, if it's gonna be, it's up to me, okay? This is why if you have an operating capital reserve account, you set the money aside, you take, you start with 1% off at every check in the door and gradually work your way up to two, three, maybe as high as 4% off at every check and it goes off into a savings account over here. Not a toys account, it's a savings account. Two signatures on it, so it's not a, an emotional withdrawal. Two people have to agree on it. You have the money set aside and depending on the company, as an example, specialty contractor like a roofing contractor, should probably have about four or five months worth of, of overhead set in there. Remodeling contractors, seven, eight, maybe nine months of overhead set aside. New home construction, uh, we're probably a year to 12, 14 months, something like that. You put the money in there, set it aside. Now, if you had that thing in place in January and February of this year, and while all this pandemic kicked in and all the problems we we're having, you didn't have any worries because your bills are paid through July, August, September. Okay, and here we're just we're just ending June. If the money's in the bank and you haven't had any jobs come in, no phone calls come in, and you don't worry, the bills are paid. You don't have to borrow money. You don't have to see this this business of going in and taking money from the government. Everybody says, Oh, it's free money, you gotta give it to your employees. There's no such thing as free money. Okay, somebody's gotta pay the freight, and we're all gonna pay for it in the coming years over increased taxes. That's just the way the government operates. Okay, so if, if, and I, I get, I get really, <laughs> I get into this because, you know, there's no free lunch. You know, if you've got to create your own lunch, if you want So you set the money aside, every check you put money aside. And then when this pandemic hits, then when IRS calls you up and say they want to audit you, then if you have like three or four people quit on you the same day, and that I've seen that happen many times. Okay. You don't worry about it because your bills are paid. So this is what's what's the thing, the biggest pitfall in this business. Most contractors, and I'm talking 90% plus of them, do not have a savings account that they can fall back on if there's a problem. So there you go. There you go. I mean, it's interesting you say that because I connect, I, I've, I talk to roofers every day and it's not something that I ever hear talked about. And, oh. you know, a lot, of, a lot of guys that get into roofing, they make a lot of money and then they go broke. And you hear the stories of mm -hmm. guys that make it really big. And then you, next thing you know, a few years in, they're filing bankruptcy. And uh, it's been told that, that, you know, the guy that hired me that I partnered with the form Roofing Mastery, he's been in this space for 20 years, got into it with his dad. But uh, he, he said somebody told him a few weeks ago, you're the, you're the poorest rich guy I know. Because if you know Miller, who's also on the show as well, he doesn't look like a wealthy guy. Mm -hmm. but he's got money in the bank and he's not yeah. worried right now. And there, there hasn't go. been a hailstorm in Dallas and uh, that's hit us in Dallas proper in a few months. And he's not worried because he has that yeah. account that you just, uh, you just talked about. Well, the, the other thing too is, is if you know, you got the money in the bank, um, if you are a storm chaser, which, you know, I don't know what term you would use for that, but I see refers all over the country, the storm chasers and there's no future in that because you can't predict what's going on. You need to set up a business plan and we'll talk more about that later on, but you set your business plan up in such a way that you have a consistent supply of leads coming in that you can go see. You've zeroed in, you know exactly what kind of work you're trying to do. You get a reputation for that. People call you, okay? And most, con most contractors don't think that far ahead. They won't do it. Well, let's kind okay. of piggyback on that and say, okay, here's a big problem. Guys, aren't, mm -hmm. guys don't have a strategic 
plan to set aside cash reserves, which is so interesting because that's it's common in real estate. You know, I spent I spent some time moonlighting in the multifamily real estate space, and it's part of every single business plan you form for any property you buy is you've got a cash reserve plan because it's you're you're planning on something going wrong. You're planning on needing cash. Yeah. So, so it's interesting you bring that up for, uh, for roofing contractors. So what's the positive side of that? What, what, what financial advice do you have of a, for a way for guys to be proactive to avoid this pitfall? Okay, here's the, 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 this is one of the issues that I see quite frequently, and that is to make darn sure that your CPA that you have that does your quarterly or sometimes quarterly, but for sure your year end taxes, that they know and understand your business. And unfortunately, and this goes, this is a broad brush stroke over all of construction. Very few CPAs in, in this country know and understand construction. And, and, and let me, give me the best example of that. When we do coaching, I always request a profit and loss statement for the last 12 months. Well, not only do they, they don't give me the last 12 months, they give me the last three or four years, which I don't want, which means absolutely nothing to me. And, they get, and, and the P&Ls they do give me are incorrectly compiled. They're virtually worthless for the contractor to sit down and, and analyze his business. And if the, if the P&Ls are set up right, in one minute, you can pull everything off of a P&L you need to know where you're at and how you're doing, okay? And so make sure your CPA knows what they're doing, all right? That's the first thing. And the second thing that I think contractors can do, which very few of them do, is provide financing for their customers. It's not that hard to do. There's banks and lending institutions out there, maybe even some private lenders, that you can partner with where uh, you can do two ways. You can either refer your customer to them to get a loan, or you can act as a dealer yourself, fill out the paperwork and submit it, a lot of times right at the, right at the table, okay? Whether a business person or a homeowner or whatever, uh, you can do the, the financing yourself, and most contractors don't do that. And the ones that do do that find a jump of 20 to 30% in business in the next 12 months, as soon as they take on the financing. We see this, and, and I travel the U.S., you know, border to border, coast to coast, every year, uh, and, and 30 to 50 trips, depending. I'm cut way back this year, but in previous years, that's what we've done. The contractors that provide financing are the ones that always do well, Okay. So those are two things that, that uh, uh, when you're looking at for, you know, uh, uh, for a contractor want to make sure that he's assuring himself some good sounded financial advice, get a good CPA, provide financing for your customers. Two things that most guys don't even think about, but they are key to making a business successful in today's climate. Okay. It's interesting you say that. There, there was recently a bill passed in the state of Texas that says that you cannot uh, pay for the homeowner's deductible. You can't work some kind of creative financial plan to make it to where basically they don't pay their deductible. You can't pay it back with a gift card and stuff like that because it's punishable by law. The homeowner can get uh, sued and or the homeowner can get um, charged for it. And you as the roofing contractor, I think it's $20,000 can get charged for it. So a lot of guys are saying, I, I still see ads on Facebook of roofers saying, you know, we'll take care of the deductible or whatever. And I'm thinking, man, these guys are, are running a risky business here, but we use it to our advantage. It's like, hey, we're going <laughs> to follow the law. We are a law abiding company. We can't pay your deductible for you. But what we can do is offer great quality service. We have a great reputation. We're going to give a warranty, work a workmanship warranty. And we're also going to do all these things to educate you in the process. And we're going to make sure that you have everything on your claim that you need, uh, you know, to make sure that we're going to, we're going to communicate with your adjuster and make sure that they know everything that should be on there as well, the damage we see. And at the end of the day, the homeowner knows they're getting great service. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use it to say, look, we're, we're working under integrity here. We're not going to discount what you need. We're going to make sure you get the job you need, but we're also not going to work some kind of creative scheme out to where you don't pay what you need to pay your insurance company. That's that whole concept of this. We'll take care of your deductible. You know, it's a race to the bottom. Everybody's worried about price. That isn't what today's customer is after. Can I give you a, an example? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. We have the building I'm in here is 24 by 36 and it's attached to our house, which is back over this way. Between the two buildings, we got 41 squares on our roof. Okay. A little bigger than average. Right. 
So I called up, I called some friends and got some referrals for two different roofers. First guy came out, showed up on time, said, I'm going to climb up. He asked me what I wanted, and I told him where I thought the bad spots were. And I said, this is what I would like to know. We're going to need a new roof, or what are we, what are we doing here? He says, give me, give me about an hour. Got his ladders out. Up on the roof he went. Came back down. He says, all right, here's the plan. You know, we got to tear everything off, and I've got to, you know, replace the flashings, and we're going to get rid of the the because the, I told him I had some some vents that the previous roofer came in and drove nails in too far, split the vents, water leaked in, ruined my living room ceiling, cost me 3000 bucks to fix. Anyway, so he climbs up there, comes down, gives me a rundown. Here's what we're going to do. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Put in ridge vents. Going to replace some uh, um, uh, some barge rafters I got up there. And he said, I said, well, put him, bring him out, and I'll paint him for it now, and I'll, I'll take care of it all going to do this, this, and this, and then we're going to clean everything up, and we're going to cover it. We're going to do it in sections, so if it rains, it won't bother us, and here's your price, and it was just under 17000 bucks. Well, I had a heart attack. <laughs> it's been a while since I did it, bro. Okay, fine. We'll get back in. So he took off and went to Alaska fishing for a week. In the meantime, I called another rougher that was also highly recommended. He's going to come out. Well, he couldn't tell me for sure when he's going to come out next week. And so we go through the next week thing. He doesn't bother to call me at all. And so the following week, I'm off to the doctor's appointment. He shows up unannounced, no phone call or nothing, walks up, knocks on the door. Oh, I'm your roofer, blah, blah, blah. And my wife told him, Michael's not here, and he wants to talk to you. Oh, well, I'll take a look. And he walked around the house, got in his car, and left. And so the next day, here comes this email with his proposed what he's going to do on it. Doesn't bother to talk to me. Doesn't say anything. He's a thousand bucks less than the first guy. Okay, but I'll tell you what. I wouldn't even consider him. I would not consider him. I'll pay the extra thousand bucks because I know what that guy's going to do for me. Okay, the second guy out. You know, he might as well not even come out here because it, it, very, very poor business practices. Number one, and he didn't. You know, he didn't tell me about. You know, the, uh, he didn't address the, the vents that I told him that I, I wanted those vents out of here because they're plastic and, you know, they should have been up there to begin with. Okay. I wanted ridge vents on everything now. And, you know, uh, and I wanted a, a decent shingle. I don't expect, you know, the, the uh, you know, $500 square shingles or anything like that. But he didn't go to, he didn't take the time to, to, to make sure that they had asked me the questions or anything else. And so I automatically eliminated him. To me, it's not about price. To me, I've got a hell of an investment in this place, okay? And that roof, that's where everything starts right there. If that roof fails, and, I, you know, I, we just sat here and for six months and had that nasty living room ceiling spot just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we couldn't figure out where it was coming from until we had a guy come out and he tore everything off until he finally found it, All right? And then we fixed it, and then we had the ceiling fixed inside. But it isn't about price. And most customers today, it's not about price. There's been surveys done showing that customers, if they say, why did you pick this contractor? Or why did you pick that contractor? Price is seventh or eighth on their list of priorities when it comes to picking a contractor. It wasn't even on my list of priorities when I had those roofers come out because I knew what I wanted. I don't care what the price is. It is what it is. You've got to pay it. Okay, pay it. Be done with it. But, but you know, if you act like a, a, a flake, you're not going to get my business. So that's that's exactly what you're just talking about. These guys are running around trying to be, uh, you know, pay the deductible. It's all about price, and that's no way to run a business. And very seldom, very seldom, do those companies last more than two, three, four years, and they're gone. Okay, that's so true. It's such a good point. I mean, you hear it mentioned <laughs> in sales over and over again that you're not selling on price; you're selling on value. You know, and I would Order before taking. I got into yeah, yeah. And, and before I got into the roofing world, I was in healthcare software sales. Oh boy. Uh, for, yeah. for a couple of years and we sold a, a very expensive software and you're selling enterprise level software to healthcare organizations and they already know it's not about price at that point because you're, you're going to change the way a lot of people do their job. You're changing the way people take notes on medical conditions. You're changing a lot of things. And anytime we would get pushback on price, I would say, well, well the software we're using now is only $600 a month. And if we sign up with you guys, it's going to be $1,300 a month. I say, okay, yeah, well, you're, you're going from three features to 10. You're probably going to save 20 hours a week of processes that are completely automated. Your nurses are going to go home earlier. They're going to be happy. Your physician burnout's going to be lower. There's all these things that are added. 
basically you're going to have a new experience, a new way of life in your work. If you want the $300 experience, go with it all day long. If that's what you're happy with, go for it because we're, we're offering you something that's a completely different. And we did the same thing when, when I got into roofing, you know, just last week, we, uh, we got the final numbers on a claim uh, for a customer. We were the second contractor to look at it. First contractor was knocking door to door in a, in a kind of a wealthier neighborhood here in Dallas, knocked on the door, 70 square roof. They said, hey, let's check it out. They went up on the roof. They came back down right then and there. They wrote an estimate for the roof, gave a one page contract to the homeowner and said, hey, if you sign this, we'll be your contractor. We can come out and take care of it next week. We come along because I actually knew the homeowner. I said, hey, let us take a look at it. We're going to spend at least an hour looking around. We're not going to get up there for 10 minutes and come back down. Let, let us just do our thing. We looked at it. We wrote up a really big estimate itemized of how much everything would cost. We took a lot of pictures. We also took drone footage and we, you know, we said we'd also like to send a supplement into your claim. You've already filed a claim. <laughs> You've already gotten the first tre- check from the insurance company. We think they left a lot of stuff off and this is not, we're not trying to do the wrong thing here. We're just said so they there's dents on your gutters. They didn't put gutters on there. You have the wrong kind of caps. You don't have UL listed caps on your roof. You've got all these extra things. Your, your fence has pot marks all over this big, nice fence you have in your backyard. They didn't add that to the claim, all these things. So we filed a claim. I mean, we filed a supplement. A traveler said, no way. We've looked at hundreds of roofs. We're not doing anything. Okay, fine. We're taking it to appraisal. Took it to appraisal. The claim has gone from $23,000 to $50,000. And the only reason is because we took the time to really analyze the situation. Mm -hmm. And then when the insurance company acted like a jerk, which sometimes they're great, in this case, they were not. We said, fine, we'll take it to appraisal. And yeah, it drew the process out a few weeks. But when you can add $25,000 of meaningful items to a claim that should have been there in the first place, it's worth it. And so the homeowner now is going, you know, I had no idea that this process could take place. I had no, I thought a roof is a roof. He had no idea. And he goes, now I'll never think about it the same. And I said, that's right. Tell all your friends, (laughs) tell all your friends because it's a process and it needs to be done the right way. And the great thing is, is now we're going to get a lot of referral business in a neighborhood that has a lot of really big roofs and it's really hard to get. You can't even go door to door in that neighborhood. They'll call the neighborhood security on you and you have to have a permit. You have to go through the HOA. Um, but we'll get referral business because of that, because we're selling value. And our, our, no, our job was not as affordable as these other guys that were knocking doors. But now the homeowner is so happy, he's getting an extra $25,000 of work done. Yeah, 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 that's the way to do it. So Let's what see. would you say, you know, kind of attaching to that, how, how do guys that are roofing contractors build a successful business and focus on that, focus on the value they offer, focus on the quality of work and not focus on price, which is a race to the bottom, which at the end of the day, going back to what you, you said your vision is people providing for their families. Well, if you constantly discount yourself and undercut yourself, you can't provide for your family. That's exactly right. I think one of the things that a lot of guys believe is that they have to drive around and give out numbers to get business, drive around and give out bids. And that's not where you wanna be. That's a race we talked about. That's a race to the bottom. Okay. When I was in business and what I recommend to contractors today is when people say we're getting three bids, good for you. Okay. (laughs) We don't play that game. We don't bid on jobs. And and I tell contractors, tell them that we don't bid on jobs. I will give you a firm price quotation when you're ready to make a decision. Now, now you put the ball in their court and they've got to decide what they want to do. Okay, I'm not bidding on your job. I don't bid on jobs. That's a race to a bottom. Sorry, I'd like my business to continue. I want to do a good job for my customers. I have to make a, I have to pay my bills and make a profit doing it to continue to do that for my customers. And this bidding game, that doesn't fall into that category. Sorry, no thank you. Nothing personal, but if you want a firm price quotation, then you tell me when you're ready to make a decision, I'll be glad to come out. And that's, and, and, and I did that. Well, let's put it this way. In the, in the last, let's see, I've been at this 59 years now. I suppose that I spent probably 30 years selling, okay, over the years. My sales to leads ratio is one out of 2.85, okay? 
right? And so that means that, you know, I, if I tell every contractor they should sell about one out of three. And with the full markup, you should sell about one out of three if you're selling, not order taking, selling. That is also coupled with a positive 8% plus on your P&L. If it's less than 8%, and something's wrong. If you're selling okay. one out of three and you're making 2%, you're not selling, you're giving your work away. Okay. okay let's pause on that. Cause I want you to be able to, I want you to be able to unpack that for people listening. You had a sales rate that was, you had a close rate that was high, but you uh -huh. said with the proper markup. So yes. can you just do some education? Like for especially specifically for roofing sales guys, mm -hmm. what kind of roofing sales advice can you give them to have a high close rate and have the right price? Okay. Best example I can give you is I've in, in our book, Markup and Profit a Contractor's Guide, I've got some rough guidelines in there for specialty contractors, which roofing would be. And so it's usually, uh, I tell them that, that absolute rock bottom minimum for a specialty contractor is cost times 1.35 and more probably as 1.40 to 1.45. That's, and, and, but everybody has to figure out their own numbers and that's all laid out in the book how to do that. So you can go ahead. I've got a roofing contractor that I have been coaching now for about eight years in Illinois. Uh, probably one of the best businessmen he is now. He wasn't when he came to me, but he is now. His markup's 1.55, okay? And he sells easily. He sells one in three. Okay, and their and their P and L is very very good. And I won't tell you. I'll just say it's it's eight percent plus. Okay, because they go out and they sell. They do everything we've talked about so far. He doesn't drive around and give up prices. People want bids. He says no, no, thank you. Just go away. And he's got three full time salesmen now, and they are just swamped with. I mean, they're still working on leads that have, that you know they they insurance leads and stuff like that. They had a big storm last year. They're still trying to work their way through them. They got more business than they can handle, and he's using a 1.55 markup on everything he does. He's making darn good money, taking good care of his family, and he's taking care of all of his employees and their families as well. And that's the important thing. Okay, so uh, roofers, uh, the idea that you can get by with 10, 15, 20 percent markup, you're not going to be a business long. Those guys are going to go away. You got to be up. Absolutely, if everything runs perfect in a company, and you're, I mean, you're absolutely run everything just perfectly, you can get by with a minimum of 1.35 times your cost. But the reality is, how many perfect jobs have you ever seen? Right. I'm still sure. looking after 59 years, I'm still looking for my first one. Okay, so it, yeah, you, you need to be at 1.4, 1.45 minimum, preferably 1.50, okay? And if you wanna survive in this business, okay? So for the guys listening to this and they say, well, okay, that's easy to say, but how do I sell that when that means I'm going to come in at X price and my competitors are going to come in cheaper? Well, we've talked about all that stuff, what you're, what you're offering. Um, the other thing I can tell you is that, that I wrote a book on called Profitable Sales, a Contractor's Guide. I would strongly recommend that. It works just fine for roofing, just like it does remodeling, new home construction, you name it, it works. And, and I told you what my sales to leads ratio, most of the guys that contributed to that book have a sales to leads ratio at least one in three. Uh, and most of them are using markups of, of 1.55 and higher, okay? I've got many contractors that use a markup times two regardless of the size of the job. And they got more work than they can handle. Yeah, but right. You it's, can't it's, worry about what everybody else is doing. You gotta focus on what you can do, what you can provide, and you gotta, you gotta also, um, uh, you gotta sell yourself, okay? You gotta dress properly. Uh, you notice I got a polo shirt on, my company logo here, my name over here, nice pants, clean shoes, I go out to see people, I act like a professional. I don't show up like I've crawled out from under a house or off the top of a roof, I'm covered with dust and tar and everything else, okay? That's not selling, that's order taking, okay? If you wanna be paid like a pro, you gotta speak, think, dress and act like a pro okay and if you can't do it then don't go out there because you're you know you eliminate yourself from most sales when you do that okay. it's so true and i you know when i first started working for rain tight general contracting the, especially having a background in online marketing i said look we you know you i know you i know miller the owner of the company you know your stuff you treat people right you do a great <laughs> job 
But if I come to your website, it's not mobile friendly. Um, it looks a little outdated and all that stuff. So just having that professional appearance, I said, look, we got to get a website redesigned. I want some shirts. We need to get some shirts in different colors. I want to have a basic, I'm going to have a basically a company uniform where I'm going to wear, <laughs> you know, khakis and a company shirt and a hat every day. Cause yep. going back to that scenario where we got the roofing job, the two guys that had it before us were dressed in there. One of them looked like he was about to go to the gym and the other <laughs> guy was wearing kind of just casual clothes, but didn't look very nice. And, uh, and I, I said, I want these things. They had no branding on their truck. I've got signs on my truck. It's my personal truck, but I basically turn it into a company truck. And, uh, you know, it's just all these little things. But the biggest thing for me is for guys that, that say, well, I can't sell against price. To me, it's I want to educate the customer. When I educate them on the process and I let them know, here's what we've done before. Here's how many happy customers we've had. Here's why they are happy. Here's all the steps. Here's what we're going to do for you here, here, and here. Here's how I'm going to follow up with you. And I'm going to call you exactly when I said I was going to call. And we're going to meet it exactly when I said we were going to meet and do all these things. Um, you know, I'll go back every time to a more expensive mechanic or a more expensive fill in the blank. If I think I'm getting a great experience, I do not want a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's how you get around it. You just do a stellar job. Yeah. Th these guys that, you know, they say, Oh, I can't sell against price. Well, of course not. You're order taking. Once you learn to sell, then you can sell against price. I mean, I, you know, when I sold remodeling in the Portland, Oregon area, there was 19 pages in the yellow pages of contractors. Now, you talk about competitive, and Portland's not that big. It's like 400,000 people. There's 19 pages in the boom book. Okay, and I still sold better than one out of three because I was selling. I wasn't order taking. I didn't worry about anybody else or their prices or any of the rest of it. Some guy told me, well, this guy's going to do it for free. Hey, I have no problem with that. He knows what his work is worth. If he wants to do it for free, go for it. Have a good time. Call me when you're ready to make a decision. And I'd <laughs> yeah. stick that right under their nose. If they didn't like it, I'd walk away. I'm not going to waste my time with people that are busting around and worried about price. That's the worst. <laughs> Trying to buy something for your home or your building based on prices you know, they said there's a saying about ignorance that can be fixed. Well, tell you what, stupid is forever. <laughs> Getting work done in your home based on price is stupid. Yeah, right, okay. right. You wouldn't do it. You, you wouldn't go with the cheapest brain surgeon if you knew your child had to have brain surgery. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly so, right. So, well, let's, let's, you've looked at, at a lot of different companies. You've worked with mm -hmm. a lot of leaders of companies. I think mm -hmm. a lot of this falls back to leadership as well, where the, the leader of the company really doesn't have a strategic plan for business, for themselves, for their own company, and also a plan of training for their, for their employees, for their sales guys. What's the best leadership advice you can give after working with so many contractors and leaders and owners of companies over the years? Okay. Um, it's kind of a three-step process. Number one, you build in top dollar in your estimates for your people where you can offer your people top dollar, okay? Then when you hire people or you, you bring them up to speed with what you're doing, you tell you you tell them, I'm gonna pay you top dollar in town. Everybody else is paying $18 for a roofer. You're willing to pay 20 or 22, okay? This is what I'm gonna pay you. Now in return for that, I'm gonna get you to use this thing up here. You're gonna think, I'm not hiring you back. I'm getting you to think. So I'm going to pay you. I'm going to show you what needs to be done. And you are going to go out and do that. And you're going to give me the best possible product you can give me. You're going to do your job to the very best of your ability. And that's how you earn top dollar working for me. Okay. Now, if you don't give me top performance, I'm going to get right in your face on it. Okay. I'm going to hold you accountable. You are, if you're taking my money, you're going to give me the best hourly rate or the best work for that hourly rate that you can give me. No stories, no excuses, no BS, no hoorah. Okay. I'm paying top dollar. I get the best job you can give me. Okay. And you, and if you take that approach and I know many contractors that I've, I've convinced them that this is the way to do it. They're doing it now. Their guys produce. Everybody's happy. The company f flows just like a just like a stream. I mean, they're just you know. This is to me is it's it's giving, paying top dollar, giving people a job, holding them accountable. That's the best job I can do as 
as the owner of a company as someone that's leading the pack, so to speak. Okay, I don't listen to any crap about, oh, my car broke down, I can't this. You know, I, I had too many beers last night. Oh, my wife's divorced me. I don't want to hear all that crap. All I want is I'm going to give you a job and I'm going to hold you accountable to do it. Okay, you got personal issues, don't bring them to work with you, leave them home. Okay, that's for top dollar. You can say that and, and insist on it with your, when you're paying top wages. It's so true. And that, you know, that, that was a scenario that, that happened to me when, when I was hired by rain tight general contracting here in Dallas, he said, look, here's what a lot of roofing companies offer their sales guys. Here's the deal I'm going to offer you. And this is the deal I have with my other sales guys. And it's, it's a good deal. And he said, he said, uh, but, but this is the way we're going to work it. This is, you know, these are my expectations. This is kind of where I think we can take this company. If we all strive for success here. Here's the opportunity. We can all be really, really happy. But he basically said, I see you as an investment. I'm being generous with you, but I'm also banking on your long-term return to the company that you're going to make yourself a lot of money. You're going to make me a lot of money too. Yeah. And this is a win-win scenario. And it yep. makes me, when I know that I'm being taken care of, well, it makes me want to do even a better job. Yeah. Last good, thing I'm going to do is think about my exit strategy or who else I could go oh, work yeah, for. I know yeah. I'm not going to have it better than I have it here. Yeah. Good salespeople look at it that way. They, you know, they're, they'll pitch in and they want the company to grow because they know they're going to make more money. You know, Absolutely. that's it. And, and, and from the, the, the downside to that is these contractors that hire salespeople and then want to try to restrict how much money they can make. That's the dumbest thing you can possibly do. You know, you got a good salesman, pay him straight commission, let him, give him the job and leave him alone. You know, say, this is what I want you to do. I'm paying you this. This is what you're going to do. And I'm going to hold you accountable for it. Just like we just talked about a second ago. Good salesmen love that situation. I've had many times I, I, people have asked me to hire me and I just tell them I work straight commission. Oh, well, we pay salary. Not to me, you don't. See, salary <laughs> yeah. means they're trying to control how much I'm making. Uh-uh. Yeah. Don't put a limit on my income. Yep. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's switch gears here a little bit. And, uh, and again, I, I, we've got to have you back on the show so that we can just make one of these questions an entire episode, but mm -hmm. get going back to your company and all the contractors you work with and working with owners of companies and companies all over the U S what's the best marketing advice you can give for, for roofing contractors, because it's all about the leads. I mean, roofers want leads and there's a lot of different ways to get leads. And of course, I've got a background in online marketing. So my goal is to kind of dispel some of the myths, expose a lot of the snake oil out there. Uh, but, but roofing leads come in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. the guys use telemarketers, guys use online marketing. They use companies like Home Advisor and all this stuff. What would you, what, what's some of the best advice you can give on roofing leads and uh, mm -hmm. roofing marketing? Okay. Well, it, it, this is personal feeling and everybody, you know, you know, everybody has opinions, you know, like certain parts of your anatomy, everybody's got it and you got to deal with it. Okay. I, to me, the, the, these online lead generating companies are, are an absolute waste of money. I mean, they're, they're, they don't do anything for you. Can't do it yourself. And even worse, if they're a scam is what they are, because if you look in, you get down to page 10, 11 or 12 in their working agreement with you. If you sign on with them, you look on page 10, 11 or 12 and you signed off the rights to your company name, your phone number, all the marketing, all your pictures, everything you have, you signed off to them and they can use it any way they want. And if you complain to them about it, they have a right to sue you. Okay. So this is things that, 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 that guys don't understand about these lead generating companies. They're a bad way to do business. Now, what's the best way? Um, the, the companies that I see do the best have a good website. This is, this is what they do. They, well, let's back up even further than that. If you're going to do marketing, first thing you got to figure out is who's our ideal customer? Who do I want to sell to? What's our market? And it isn't everybody in the world. You want to zero in and, and, you know, like Zig Ziglar used to say, you want to be a meaningful specific, not a wandering generality. All right. So you figure out who your ideal customer is. Okay. Now, then you in turn have got to figure out what your ideal job is. What job do you make the most money at? Okay. Well, I don't like to do this. It has nothing to do with what you like. It has to do with making money. And, and if you don't get your arms around that, you're never going to go anywhere in this business world. Okay. So you figure out what you like to do. You find out who your ideal customer is. And then the secret to marketing is figuring out how to tell people 
about your ideal, tell the ideal customer about your ideal job and get the two together. That's, that's true marketing, okay? The best way I've seen contractors do that is you get their website set up and fine-tuned so that you can get that ideal customer. You gear your website to the ideal customer so they in turn call you about your ideal job. And when you do that, that's when you start making money. It's so good. Yeah. You know, being in, being in online marketing for years, we, the company I was with beforehand, we worked with hundreds of customers and built a lot of websites. And a lot mm -hmm. of people would call us saying, well, we want to do Google pay-per-click ads. We want, you know, a plumber would call us and say, look, we, I've, I've got some other plumbing friends that have done it. It's worked for them. I want to do Google pay-per-click ads. Like, okay, well, let's do an analysis of your website real quick. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait is this your website? This one page thing that's like a weird yeah, yellow yeah. brown that was built back in 1990 that we, we got to change that because if we do ads and send people to a website, that's the customer's first impression. Yep. And they're, even though you're an expert and you're a great person and people love you, this person that doesn't know you at all, this is the first handshake mm -hmm. they get. This is the mm -hmm. first impression and first impressions matter. So I know you want to get into ads, but I'm sorry, we got to get you a website built. And I know you weren't thinking of spending a couple thousand dollars on getting a website or whatever, but it's got to be done first. So I'm a hundred percent with you on that. Yeah. I forget the exact numbers, but something like five or six out of every 10 people that call you go to your website before you even are aware that they're alive. They go to your website, check you out first, and then if they like what they see, they will call you. And if your website is a single page or, or a blob like most of them are, okay, uh, they're not going to call you. Okay, and and I, I forget what it is. It's, it, it, the, the statistics is said that something like for every one phone call you get out of the yellow pages, you'll get 30 out of, out of a good website. The ratio is 30 to 1. And so a guy say, well, we don't advertise. You know, you, you, you can't help people that don't want to be helped. You don't, well, we work by referral. No, you don't. You want to go out of business? You just come up with this crap you work by referral. You need a website. That's where the good leads come from. Because you work by referral, you're taking whoever calls you, where if you have a good website, you can, you can pick and choose the people that call you about the job you want to do. Referrals, you can't pick and choose the job you want to do. You got to take whatever they come at you with. And that's not, that's not where I'd want to be in business. Okay. It's so good. You know, the, when we have, we do free consultations for people, uh, do a free web analysis of their site and their online presence. And one of the things we talk about when we look at their site is, okay, Hey, we analyzed your site. It looks decent or, Hey, we analyzed your site and it, it's really quite poor. The quality's poor for these reasons. We think we can make it better by doing these things or doing a total rebuild. But a lot of times we'll say, you know what, your website looks good, but it's not a sales tool. And we look at a website as this is the top of the funnel, the sales funnel, the sales process when people find you and you're making it kind of hard for them to know what you want them to do. And you've got a great brand. You've got a great, you know, the top of the, of the web page is the first part people see you look professional, but there's no form. There's no call to action. There's no social proof of reviews or anything like that. And your competitors have that stuff. A lot of them have that stuff. So let's make some changes to where you're actually, your website is a tool and it's a leadership tool. You're leading people down a path. Yep. And I looked at your site as well and you do a good job of showing right out of the gate. You've got a video of you educating people on what you're mm -hmm. doing. So you catch them right away. Like, wow, okay, this guy's a, this guy's a thought leader. He's an industry expert and he's telling me some things I need to know. And then he's also telling me where I can go to find it. And now I'm spending time on his site. Okay. Now I've, I'm looking at stuff. He's got some paid resources and your site kind of, your site does that in a very intuitive way to show people what they can get and why they can get it. And so yeah, I'm, I'm, we work I'm on our on website that. every day. Yeah. <laughs> Literally every day. Yeah, we have to, I mean, we've had that website now for uh, 1998 which is what, 22 years we've had that website. Okay. Got a, close to a thousand articles on there, you know, papers or stuff we've written. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, I, I guess after all said and done, the main thing I would tell guys is if you're le using these lead generating companies, get away from them, go on your own, find yourself somebody that's good with SEO and, um, you know, build your website up. Um, the other thing, one, uh, one other thing I would like to mention on websites, when you have a, an about us thing in there, 
make darn sure you have all the principles of the company's picture on that about us. Don't assume people know what you look like. People want to know who they're talking to when they when you knock on their door or when you go to their place of business to talk about their roof or whatever it is. But you need to have your pictures on your website. And if you don't, you know, if you've got three or four principles in there, and then if you have different crews, take a picture of the crew and put them on there. Put their names on there. Okay. Now, if somebody doesn't want their name on, that's a different issue. But people today, I mean, you, you know, there's so much paranoia out there. People today want to see pictures of who's going to show up at the door. If you have salespeople, just say a sales representative, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, they, there's so many terms that people try to come up with to keep them calling from themselves, keep from calling themselves salespeople. <laughs> hey, you're in sales. Tell people that, you know. Right. I used to have that right on my business card, Michael Stone, salesman. Yep. I put it right on and hand it to people. You know? Well, everybody else already knows that anyway, so you might as well just shoot straight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so with that, that, you know, with that said and your website and all the stuff you offer, uh, you know, cause we're going to include a link to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to your website in the show notes. We're also going to have a transcript for the, so for those of you watching or listening to this, you can go view the transcript. Mm -hmm. Um, when you, when you talk about lead generation companies and stuff, you're talking about bigger platforms, right? Like home advisor or yeah. stuff like that, where it's basically you go in and they give you a lead, but they're also giving that lead out to multiple contractors. Yeah. And your solution to that is, hey, work with somebody that can do online marketing for you and drive business to yep. you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. I think otherwise, again, we've said it, it's interesting. We've said it a few times on this podcast, but it is a race to the bottom at that point. Oh boy. It's not yeah. what you want to get into. So yeah. what's the, so what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Okay. Um, can, can we talk about one other thing real quick oh, before absolutely. we get into where that, right. Um, one of the things I think that a lot of contractors don't do that they should do, and that's plan for their future. They, they just worry about what's going to happen today, tomorrow. When's this pandemic going to be over? They don't plan three, five, 10 years from now. They don't plan. They don't set goals for the year. Um, and this is, this is kind of tied with, with how people can reach us. Our website has two papers on it, and that's called Year End Review and Next Year's Planning, Parts 1 and 2. And I would encourage all contractors to download those papers. They're free. We've given them free. We haven't had anybody send us additional comments or changes on anything in three or four years now. So we know those papers are good. You got 13 single space typewritten pages of things you need to do at the end of each year and how to plan for next year. And the contractors that do that invariably will call me back in August or September and tell me they've already reached their rear, your, your, the rear, the, this year's goals and they're already planning for next year and they still have three or four months left in the year to make more money than they, they ever dreamed possible. Okay. Cause they, they, you know, they, they planned the year, they've set goals, they reviewed last year, know what they have to do this year, they plan it. And so I would encourage everybody to, to get on our website and do the year end planning next year's uh, uh, year end review and next year's planning papers. There's two of them, parts one and two. And a contractor will do it. They'll find that it'll make a huge difference in their business. Okay, where do you find those? All right, markupandprofit.com uh, is our website. And uh, uh, when you get on there, it's it's you know, you're going to 22 years worth of building, and there's a lot of stuff on there as you and I talked about earlier. Uh, so uh, that would be a a, a um, that would be the best place to start. Okay. Of course, you can always call or send me an email or something. I'd be glad to help. Uh, if I would, I'd like to, to put a plug in for a couple of educational things coming up. Um, October 29th and 30th, Thursday and Friday, October 29th and 30th this year, we're going to be doing our two-day class, uh, which for um, uh, it, it would apply for roofers like it does any other contractor. Interesting thing about that two-day class we've taught. We've taught that now since November of 2014, a little over six years. We've had about 1,300 companies that have attended that class. Normal failure rate in construction will range anywhere from 25 to 50 percent in four or five years. In other words, about half the people get into this business will be gone in four or five years. Okay. In the six years we've done this class, of the 1,300 contractors that have attended this class, to our knowledge, only four have failed. 
So wow. that class will make that much of a difference. And, and, you know, and that's unsolicited. It's just, we know this stuff works. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with good sound business practices. So when you have less than a 1% failure rate of people coming to this class, that, that says, you know, that class is well worth the time. So anyway, you can find that on our website, our, our two day, uh, making the numbers working construction class. We also have two other classes coming up. They're one hour classes where I get on and talk 15 or 20 minutes like we have this morning. And then I answer questions for probably 30 or 40 minutes. We have one coming up on July 9th on how to work with subcontractors and suppliers. And we have another one coming up on July 23rd on dealing with architects and designers. Um, uh, you know, the, the intricacies of, and this would apply to roofers as well. Uh, so we, we've got we've got some classes coming up, and I think it will be a while there's the time going. Um, Michael at markupandprofit.com will get me emails in. Uh, our phone number is 360-335-1100. Really easy number to remember. Um, you can type Michael Stone on the Internet, and I will pop up usually in the top first page or something. That's another way to get a hold of me. But... Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to be there to help guys take care of their families. You know, and that's what we do. Well, yeah. you guys do a great job. And mm, I know you. the people listening and watching got a lot of helpful insights from this. And um, so the recording of this will be up on our website at roofingmastery.com. We'll also post it to LinkedIn. So for those listening, they can find you on LinkedIn as well. And I connected mm -hmm. with you there and appreciate how responsive you are because I know you guys stay busy. So, Michael, oh, yeah. thanks again for joining the show. No, you're more than welcome. Thanks for having us and uh, look forward to next time. Absolutely. Mm.